Are we on? Here. What? Uh, oh, there you go. That fits fucking perfect. <laughs> that's actually creeping me out. <laughs> Holy Christ! Damn, that's one demerit for I've a. I've never seen. Damn, bring a stellar odd wad of a podcast. <laughs> it's not. It's your birthday. Well, we got. We'll announce birthdays because I'm one of, one of my fucking uh, Larry King, uh, Z, the Z Morning Zoo. Well, it's Dan McGrath's birthday. We're going to send a little lover boy out to him. <laughs> Danny McGrath drinking a stellar aqua. He'll be talking to a 92-year-old woman tonight at the train wreck. <laughs> she was... Last night we went out to train... Dan, just please. We, we just... I mean, just please. One second. Uh, you know, you need a microphone. I'm going to announce your birthday. And then you talk. Where's his microphone? Again, the two mic thing. I almost don't want to touch that. It looks too perfect. That's like a birthday cake made for the Lucchese family. Uh, we're back again. Guess who's back? Paul Morrissey's here. He, the addition uh, that we needed. Now, Paul, explain. Uh, give us your resume. Give us your filmography. Uh, I don't know. I feel like we're doing We Are the World right now. We're doing a duet <laughs> for the, me and Russ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm Quincy Jones. Uh, I may, I pranked Check you. Check your about, ego at the door. I pranked you on the uh, the bootleg fireworks. That's what most people would know me from. Oh, that's the best ever. It's the best ever. We we have no way of playing that back, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, get 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 the water, nigga. That should be my fucking slogan, my 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 catchphrase. You remember when uh, what's the guy's name? Jesse Atuturo. <laughs> Jason Pierre Paul. <laughs> Jason Pierre Paul, the the uh, the French guy of the Giants. Uh, remember he blew his hand off with a, with a uh, fireworks yeah. right. Two days before he signs a $60 million contract. <laughs> with the hand he's going to sign the contract with, he blows his fucking hand off with fireworks. And that, that looks like you guys are blowing a black guy in a bathroom. <laughs> looks like you're blowing Patrick Ewing. <laughs> it looks like you're negotiating. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, Dan, that fits perfect. There's a bucket... A bucket of ice that I usually get here uh, because the service is so great here at the Sheridan. Uh, they haven't had my name on the room for four straight nights now. And a woman, a, a millennial woman, is so scared to death. You know why? Because my face doesn't look like a laptop screen. She doesn't know what the fuck to do. The, 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 I'm a, the pizzeria across the street from me, Uptown Pizza, was started by a guy I used to shoot pool with. His name was Paulie. And he died of cancer. And I mentioned his pizzeria on the Stern Show once, and he was inundated with business. And for that alone... He let me have free food for the rest of my life. Wow. Okay. Still, even. Uh, well, he passed it down. He told when he was dying, he said to the people who worked for him, Artie gets free fucking pizza forever. Wow. And uh, it lasted until the Italians sold it to the Syrians. <laughs> and uh, there was a fatwa between them and the Exxon station. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so, so now they sold it to millennials. All right. These three millennial kids work there. Okay. They're about 25, 26 years old. You know a local pizzeria? You get the same thing every day. You walk in, what it used to be like. Hey, you see a giant game? Hey, you, 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 you pepperoni, right? You want extra cheese? as your mother doing everything good? But, you know, uh, that, that, did that clear up on your neck? Yeah. Uh, okay. It's, a, it's called a neighborhood business, right? Okay. I've been ordering every other day. I order almost the same thing. I get a pizza with two sides of meatballs, a chicken parmesan, and I sound like me on the phone. Dan, of course, orders a cheese Selling pizza. Me. It's so embarrassing, Dan, with the cheese pizza. How could Chicago be that out of touch with Italians? Chicago Italians are like wasps here. And he thinks, you, when you want cheese on a pizza, how do you order a pizza? You say a pizza, right? I'll have a cheese pizza. I'd like a cheese pizza. What do you think you're going to get if you order a pizza? Like a piece of bread and gravy? All right, Dan doesn't want to talk. All right. He's astonished with the cub win. Uh, okay. Every other day I call for a year. I go, hey, how you doing? It's Artie. Phone number? Uh, right, well, it's Artie. My phone number's the same. Have you ever... Phone number? Uh, 201 uh, address? It's the same every day. It's the same guy. The same guy. Oh, wait. It's on the... Now she sees it on the computer. Two constitution... I'm like, yeah. What do you... Uh, what's your order? The same. The same as every day. A pizza with two sides of meatballs. Would you like bread? No, I never get bread. I never get bread. <laughs> Would you like a salad? I never get a salad. It's Artie. Name? <laughs> name? Artie. Last name? Lang. Okay, uh, how are you going to pay? Cash or credit? I never pay credit. I've never paid credit once. Cash? <laughs> then they send one of the Syrians over. 
it looks like Jihadi John every day. And with an attitude of like, you know, and I tip them, like, you know, the old guys, the Italian guys, when they sent their cousins, I would give them a $20 tip. They would help me move a dead body. <laughs> I used to send them for peanut M&M's, underwear, uh, you know, Suboxone, and whatever. And uh, a diner truck emote from the TikTok diner. And is the pizza as good with the Syrians or what? No, it dropped a lot. Yeah, why do you It go? dropped a lot. But it's now place? now an Italian guy is back there in the back, and uh, it's better. But it was downhill for a long time. It was like fucking chewing gum. It was rubber. And uh, But at least they were personable. They were, hey, Artie, how you doing? Even with the accent. These people, like white millennial kids, I hate them. I hate them. <laughs> what are you studying? Theater? <laughs> I hate them. So uh, after I say Artie three times, I go name. <laughs> and then Dan calls. They know they can get over on Dan. I like a cheese pie. Uh, 201. 973. And then he gives the wrong number. I haven't had the same phone number uh, in... in uh, Two hours. If they try to call, <laughs> if they try to call the number we give them, it won't answer because I give them the other number that has the, the fucking address on it. Uh, and Danny's too nice to them. You have to be confrontational with them, Dan. You have to yell at them. You have to say, listen, millennial, this is Dan from Chicago. A pizza has cheese on it. If you want extra cheese, how do you order it? A pizza with cheese? No, I got. I got. You know, I wasted five fucking aprons on this fucking kid. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so my point is, it's like they're downstairs. There's millennials at the desk here, and they saw Danny change my name. They saw him change my fucking name. Uh, and uh, she's a deer in headlights. I go back today. The name's not on the room. You saw me change it to the fucking room. Same girl? Same girl with glasses on. I just hope somebody will fuck her. Dan, can you fuck oh. her, please? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's Dan's birthday. Dan is 50. How are you? Old. Do what time? Well, give him the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Now I get to blow the black eye. Your instincts, uh, well, <laughs> I was going to do a mother joke, but I can't. Talk. <laughs> you tee that one up. Now, how do you feel? Do you know the exact time of day you were born? No. Uh, now, is it a cesarean? <laughs> no. And, uh, so, so uh, how do you feel about being 50? Did you ever think you'd get to 50? No. Don't mean Did you ever think you'd look as healthy 40? at 50? Yeah. Did you ever think you'd look as healthy at 50? Actually, what, no. Wait, about a buck ten? Yeah. Good <laughs> clothes on. You look good, though. You were always, I was telling uh, Russ, you were always, uh, you know, uh, my, my, I'll give you my best friend, my brother. You, you, there's nothing you would not do for me. And uh, likewise. Honestly, and I love you. I mean, uh, I saw your 50th birthday coming up. I said, you want to come to St. Louis? You've never been to St. Louis before, and now we're here. And it's costing me a lot of money. And <laughs> <laughs> well, not done yet. You know, incidentals are not covered. <laughs> 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 you fucked the maid, right? <laughs> There's no hot maid for me to fuck here. Uh, so, I mean, happy birthday, man, honestly. Thank and, you, uh, you know, uh, at your 75th birthday, we're all going to get together again. <laughs> Do you think who do you think will die first, me or you? Actually, you. What would you say at my funeral? <laughs> well, I have stress. <laughs> well, uh, by the way, I buried some money for you. I'll give you the address. <laughs> I'll give you the address in the hospice. What will you say at my funeral? Will you say anything? If your mother will let me. Sure. So what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would you say? Assume you could uh, say something at my funeral. I say you only know half. Right. So, would you give the number that you owe me? <laughs> no, because your, your mother would buy it. <laughs> no, my mother owes me more money. <laughs> Who paid for those Stella Adwas? You. Uh. I just don't know it yet. I mean, I just don't like when you get something and you don't ask me first. At least ask Dan. You didn't answer the fucking door. Oh, so then you just get it? You told, you told me you should have got it. You're you like the millennials at the pizzeria, name. <laughs> so, Dan, so 50, and what do you think? So far, what's the what's the health regimen for you? What, what do you what do you do to stay in uh, shape? Do you do anything? Do you yeah. nothing? No. It's all. Does even you can grab the mic. Uh. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> do you do any working out at all? Is there any Not health? Anymore. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. You look pretty good, yeah. and you you always stayed thin your whole life. For the most part, until I was in rehab, then I got fat. No way. No, yeah, yeah. Two fifty. Really? What yeah. do you now? About one eighty. Wow. Jesus. Two fifty. Yeah. That's that's substantial. I gained, gained uh, what, 90 pounds of rehab when I went away. 
in '95. And what are you? Because you weren't doing drugs in rehab, and yeah, or well, what? For the most part, I wasn't doing drugs. Right. I mean, so a the, couple times. But, so the, yeah. the, the drugs help keep the weight off. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, I guess right. it depends on what you're doing, right? What were you in rehab for? Are you a pitcher? <laughs> hurt your arm? Yeah, yeah. My, co- my, my coke arm. <laughs> Lang did the intervention, which was great. Where was he? Oh, your intervention. Where yeah. was that? At my, at my apartment in Union. Lang yeah. uh, walked in one day. He said, want to grab lunch? I said, sure. He walks in and sits down. You know Lang, he's always moving around. Yeah. So something's wrong. Right. right away, I got paranoid. I'm like, what's yeah. going on? All of a sudden, my back door's open. I'm like, who's that? He said, your mother. I go, well, he was my mother. How the fuck do you know? You can't sit through a wall. All of a sudden, 14 people are in my apartment. <laughs> wow. And how long ago was this? 2003. 2003. We have the uh, intervention. Oh, oh, oh. I've got both sides of those. <laughs> <laughs> the best you can tell the story about. The one for Casey Armstrong is the best. I, I, I was just going to say that oh, because you're sitting there. He looks like a male model. Yeah, oh, and, <laughs> and you're telling him. <laughs> so, so Casey, I, Casey was acting nuts, you know, and... Uh, and, and they call me because uh, Casey told his mother that I'm his best friend at the show. I've been there two weeks. And uh, I was like the Judd Hirsch in Taxi for some reason. Everybody confided in me. John told me about The Tonight Show a year before he had to tell Howard. And I said, John, tell Howard. That's my only advice to you. And uh, he told Howard a week before the New York Post knew, and that worked out great. Uh, and and uh, I said, tell Leno. He should call Howard. It's up to him. And uh, John... John said, I said, I, 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 I don't want to blow the deal. <laughs> I said, the deal. He goes, All right, you know, I want to write a book about overcoming my stuff. Uh, Didn't he get a crazy amount of money for that stern? Well, 300 grand a year. I, 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 yeah, but he's making 80 an hour, supposedly. And uh, Leno said, eh, I don't know, how, eh, 80 grand a year, eh, I, can, I can do better for him. And uh, John said he was going to be a writer, too. So, uh, you know, I said, John, you're the reason we fought the Revolutionary War, man. You, 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 you ha- you're not a comedian, but you've toured every club in the country. You're not a musician. You've had two record deals. You have a speech impediment. You're getting the single most coveted spe- speaking job in the history of television. Uh, on his audition tape, Leonard said, listen, you know, uh, NBC is on board, but just send over, a, you know, a demo tape. He goes, make believe there's guests on the show. Pick a couple of celebrities and announce them. Okay, pick Nicolas Cage. He says the N-word in his audition. Oh, no. Get out of here. Nicholas Cage. Yeah. <laughs> Am I lying? Am I lying? Oh, Russ, no, do you not believe me? Yeah. Nicholas no, Cage. And then he goes, Nicholas Cage. He said nigger every time. <laughs> I said, John, you say nigger in your audition for The Tonight Show. And N- Cage. <laughs> Nicholas Cage. <laughs> Greatest joke ever by Greg Nettles. Billy Martin put it in his book. There was a guy, Wayne Cage, a black guy who played on the Cleveland Indians in the 70s. And uh, Greg Nettles said to Billy Martin when they were taking batting practice, hey, 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 Skipper, how come that guy has his address on his back? It said Cage 12. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's that's how third baseman used to roll. <laughs> the, 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 and Billy Martin put it in his book. Nettles didn't put it in. His, Billy Martin outed him. <laughs> Cage twelve. He had a huge afro. <laughs> oh God, that's funny. That's when men were men. That's when men were fucking men. He said to Louis Tian when he got uh, the Cuban guy. He said that when they get on a plane, hey Louis, look at that sign. You can't come on here. It said foreign foreign objects not allowed. <laughs> He was a funny guy, Nettles. Uh, supposedly very racist. Uh, but Mickey, Mickey Rivers said that he hated Reggie Jackson so much that Greg Nettles was racist and he'd rather punch out Reggie Jackson. <laughs> um, From Madonna, months, right? Reggie Jackson, that was a problem with him? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. But he delivered, man. He delivered. Yeah. I mean, nobody does that. You know, if you, if you do, even Munson after that third home run, it's like, fuck, I got I to gotta shake the guy's hand. Yeah. Three home runs, man. Right. And big homers. That last one was a bomb. Yeah. Uh, I was at the game 10 years old. Uh, so, uh, now, when, when did we meet Dan? I want to tell a couple of stories about Dan here. Now, August of uh, 79. So, August of 79. Again, I went to the Connect School Broadcasting. I know about microphones. Right? Right there for you me. have to speak into them. Uh, August of 79. How do you know August? Just when I fucking moved there. Oh, all right. Well, we didn't meet till school, I think. I, September 1st. The first interaction with Dan. Dan's the type of guy, especially in school, all the black kids would wanted to pay me to get his, na- his mother's name because they were sort of like, talking about mothers. You could, know, you could know Dan for a minute and you already can feel comfortable talking about his mother. Uh, it's just that kind of guy. So uh, the worst student I've ever, I don't think I've ever seen somebody 
behave worse in school than you. I mean, I, I was bad, but I don't think anyone behaved worse than you. And future cop written all over. <laughs> I'm leaving, I'm, I'm leaving uh, 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 the school, and Jim was my last uh, class. And I'm walking out. Now, we had in, <laughs> the tier lockers. Right, tier lockers. So the, last, the lockers were up top, had their own door. Okay. I'm leaving, and a, I guess a 13-year-old Dan McGrath, 12-year-old Dan McGrath, I see Doug DeLuca and Stets and uh, uh, Greg, uh, Curry. Greg Curry. Uh, Dan's going, Mrs. Curry's too furry. That's right. <laughs> uh, and uh, and Greg Curry had a brother who was a little, uh, uh, you know, like a loafer. And if you talked about that, forget it. Forget it. He got red, red with anger. So uh, they're giving Dan a wedgie, and his underwear will not break. Will not break. Just, and these are big kids. Like, just keeps going like this. Like, ah, and he Dude. keeps talking about their mother. He's like, your mother sucks. Like, stop talking about our mothers, and we'll stop doing this. And he wouldn't stop talking about their mothers. So they hang him on the top thing. They hang him on the locker. And I'm looking at this, and I didn't love the Luca. But I said, I don't know this kid well enough. I'm not going to get in trouble for this. So I leave. You're hanging from the locker when I leave. Yeah. Like, they left him. He was hanging from the locker. <laughs> I leave, and I, I meet Mrs. McGrath for the first time. She's in a, a, a Chevy Impala. And, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, son? Yeah. Do you know my son, Daniel McGrath? I said, yeah. Is he in there? I said, yeah. And uh, she said, what is he doing? And I said, he's hanging around. <sighs> I said, I said uh, he's inside. He's in the gym. He's getting ready to leave. She said, uh, well, how long do you think it'll be? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Where do you buy your underwear? Uh, and I said, I don't know. But, I, you know, I actually felt bad for him. I told him. I said, uh, he's having a little trouble, but he'll be out. So uh, that was every day I saw Danny getting a wedgie. And every day, I don't know. They then hung you from the telephone pole at Hoppy's Park, right? Yeah, or did you hang somebody else from that? I think I hung somebody. That was there. karma. Yeah, you hung a kid from there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I so think he was a person. Twice of, come out. Yeah, yeah. Was per, twice? The kid was a person of color. <laughs> and um, yeah, so you, uh, you had bad karma because you would give a lot of wedgies. <laughs> now, what were your grades? Did you fail every class at one point? No, I only failed uh, biology. Oh, but we were in summer class, a summer school together. To get, yeah, gym, to get, biology. Did you fail gym? Why did you fail gym? Well, he failed Jim. I failed Jim, too, but well, how did you fail Jim? Because I told Flynn he was drunk, Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn was a drunk, yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah, they don't like you to point that out, though. Mr. Flynn would sit there like this. Yep, exactly. And he's like he was substituted. He was, just like always, he he was always loaded. He was always loaded. on the field, and I said, <laughs> you dropped this. <laughs> Get out! Get yeah, out, yeah, yeah, out. yeah. That was terrible. Uh, so you had to go to summer school with me to. Uh, we had Saturday detention together every Saturday, including baseball season. I was on the baseball team. I was late for batting practice every day because I had Saturday. I took it in corduroys. Uh, I made all state in corduroys, and uh, Dan was always with me. In uh, in uh, I'll tell I'll tell the Saturday detention story. And then I want to tell the Alfie story with the woo woos. And the, the, the rib bones. Uh, they're, they're so amazing. So um. Okay. We're late for Saturday detention. If you're late for Saturday detention, you get suspended. If that happens twice, you're going to get... Two more. You can't go to school anymore. So Dan was on his last strike. We go into uh, the cafeteria, and we sit there. Dan is, like, closer to me than you. I and mean, we're not allowed to laugh or do anything. Look straight ahead. And this black kid, Scott Russell, was in a fatwa with Dan. Uh, he, you and him were always talking about each other's mothers. Yeah. And uh, Scott Russell's behind you. Well, sort of to, at an angle. I see him. He dips his pretzel in mustard, and he throws it. He does a lob like this at McGrath. Oh, yeah. Perfect. perfect. It, was perfect. It, hits da- it hits his face, and it a streak of mustard, down. like an Indian, goes right. Now, I'm, I'm this far away from him. You see, <laughs> and now he's got yellow mustard. Scott Russell is going, <laughs> he's high-fiving everybody. He's like, <laughs> McGrath is so bad. You know? And his hair was frozen. Yes. Okay, I'm looking at him. I'm like, Dan, don't say anything, but I, I can't stop giggling. And McGrath goes to me. Fucking shine, hit me with a pretzel. Right? <laughs> Fucking shine, hit me with a pretzel. <laughs> so I said, Dan, just don't worry about it. Wait till we're done. We had four hours. I yeah. stare at him. Like, first half hour, hit me with a pretzel. Fuck right. that. Within five minutes. You gotta go. So, Scott, so Dan uh, knows that he eventually going to have to go to the bathroom. So he starts taking notebook paper this size out of my notebook. Yeah, totally and, that uh, size. And he just starts putting it in his mouth. He chews about five of them, oh, yeah. and it gets saliva all over. He takes out the biggest, wettest spitball I've like ever this seen. This my hand. Scott Russell walks over to Mr. DeBarbery and says, I got to go to the, the bathroom. He's four feet from Dan. Dan, now you were a fourth in javelin, right? What were you? You were Junior in Olympics, Junior yeah. Olympics. He came in fourth for yeah. throwing the javelin. All right. Dan gets up and throws 
as hard as he can, a spitball at fucking Scott Wrestling. And he was a dark black kid. It stuck to his neck. And he went, he, he went, ah! <laughs> you heard like a whop! <laughs> it was the best spitball throw in the history of spitballs. They were invented for this throw. So it sticks to his neck a little bit, and then all the white saliva comes down his neck. And, <laughs> and he falls to his knees like Willem Dafoe in Platoon. Yeah, he was gone. Mr. DeBarbie goes, McGrath out! <laughs> and Ryan looks at me and goes, I said, I, said, I said, if we lose our breaks, because I was in right home. So he gets out. Three hours later, I walk out. He's freezing. The mustard's still on his face. Uh, and uh, I said, McGrath, we lost all our fucking breaks because of you. And he goes, Lang, I'm going to get kicked out of fucking school. My father's going to beat the shit out of me. I'm going to get kicked out of my house, and I'm freezing. I give a fuck if you're in 30... Sp <laughs> Everything was racist. Every word was racist. Every, you were 30 shines. Uh, yeah, exactly. And he's a cop. Uh, and that was tame. Um, so, 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 so like, like white, white kids who were blue-collar were offended by him. Like, you know, uh, people in the Klan would have been offended. And he says it loud. Like, you know. Fucking <laughs> dead. And so he goes... <laughs> so he goes, uh, take me to get the kitchen sink at Jan, which was a big ice cream sundae. So, uh, by the way, you're, you're really being very endearing to the audience. <laughs> you're going to get a lot of commercial deals with it. Uh, so I take you for the ice cream sundae, and you were, in fact, uh, almost thrown out of school forever. Yeah. Right. And when, when did you get your diploma? Did you get it after summer school? Yeah, same we were in August. So we, we had community service together because yeah. of a crime we did. And we were with Mickey Trezor. Now, yeah. tell the Mickey Trezor story that uh, you started locking him up with his sister, right? Oh, yeah. His sister's dead. Yeah, she's dead. Smoking. Oh, yeah. Smoking. Very fuckable. Uh, yeah. Now, we had, to wash the, the we had to wash the fire trucks. <laughs> we had to wash ambulances. <laughs> oh, that was just such a fun oh, time. Yeah. But, uh, you know. Did you, did you plan on being a cop? No. They were hiring. McGrath said to me, I said, Dan, are you going to go to junior college? He goes, it depends on if the Giants cover. <laughs> <laughs> they and uh, if you looked at Dan, the Giants did not cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we hu we hustled nine ball in the junior. Yeah, you right? hustled nine ball. That's right, man. That's right. I was like, supposed to be in class, and like, I look, looking like supposed to be in fucking English fucking one on one or some shit. And like, <laughs> I just joke, I walk by the class, it's like dust on his seat. Like, no one's been there in weeks. Go upstairs, he's shooting pool in the fucking in the fucking record. We used to have a scam with nine ball where my buddy Deej would set me up every three way nine ball. Oh, yeah. we, we wouldn't tell the other kid that we knew each other. So there was money on a five and money on a nine. You got twenty bucks on a five, fifty on a nine. And Deej would pretend to miss and set me up with a oh, shot. Yeah, you were and boom, yeah. like, you know. The one time the kid figured it out. And uh, we got kicked out of here. We couldn't do it anymore, so we had to get jobs. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I can't believe you went to the academy. But then it was rock star time. When you were... Uh, 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 it was rock star time. Good times. Like about four years. And uh, I thought this segment would go better, but... Um, <laughs> the point is, uh, you know, you get on the microphone and you're not you anymore. That's why, you know, you're, you're the funniest kid ever, but you get a little intimidated by black cylindrical things. <laughs> Uh, I was intimidated by a fucking microphone. Okay. I always thought you would be a great uh, a comic, but you have a thing with stage fright, right? Dan always wanted to look cool, as opposed to me. You, you, you were upset if your shirt was out and stuff like that. And uh, you know, uh, but I love you. You're like you're like an older brother to me, and I appreciate it. I love you too. Uh, so uh, stuck up for everybody. My sister with Bobby Bantang stuck up for. Her. That's right. Bobby, by the way, doing thirty years. <laughs> yeah, rackets here. He fell in with the wrong people. And he flipped. So Bobby is now a different name in Iowa. <laughs> uh, uh, Chuck Berry died. Uh, and we're in St. Louis. Now, uh, of course, Russ Manu is here again. Russ, uh, Russ is the best stand-up comic I've ever worked with on the road. Oh, it's so nice. Uh, uh, Paul, okay, take it easy. Uh, Paul Mars is here, too. But, Russ, I thank you for uh, for being you. I Russ puts it. up with a lot of st stuff on and off stage. <laughs> uh, I, he didn't know about Danny coming here for his 50th birthday until I believe he was sitting next to him on a plane. <laughs> and, yeah, we had one of those planes where your head's at a right angle like that. <laughs> yeah, that was... You United. What is with the United? I don't know. I don't oh, know. my good God. Me and Nick DiPaolo flying back from Buffalo on Easter Sunday. His, his head's like that. Uh. <laughs> hey, Lang, let's, 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 let's start a pizzeria. Let's make <laughs> these are like planes from the 70s. I mean, these planes. They're all like, fucked up. Yeah. But you thought it was because of John. I mean, John gets, uh, are there better planes in St. Louis that I'm not aware of? No. What? 
No, they those are the non uh, revenue slots. So these are like government mandated. Some of these because not a lot of people. But are they are safe? Like the, I mean, uh, well, most of the crashes come from the smaller planes. Okay, let's just. <laughs> So why are we doing it then? I mean, like we have money to. I mean, I have enough money to go on a better plane. I think. <laughs> Just adjust that. Uh, so now, do you have fun on these trips, Russ? I feel like I you're, love it. You do? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. Why wouldn't I? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, because I, I, I mean, I really, I, you know, I don't realize the kind of loser I am until I oh, see people God. looking at me out of the corner of my eye, like you're crazy. Most stuff I do, people are like. Yeah. Well, let me just say, let me interrupt. Artie Lang beloved by his fans and his friends. They don't know me. Well. <laughs> no, no, the fans, the, the, the St. Louis, we haven't been here in a while. They are very affectionate, yeah. St. Louis. They are. All of it. In the last gig we did, same thing. Detroit. You know. Uh, I think no. it's in your head more than, more than anything. Well, it's a testament to Howard. I always told Howard, I said, you've got to go on the road to see the love that you, you have. And with America's Got Talent, he did. And, uh, of course, Nick Cannon was with him. Uh, <laughs> Nick Cannon. I caught Nick Cannon's last stand-up special. I, I can't tell you how annoyed. I, it's, it's the single most annoying thing. Diane Cannon is funnier. <laughs> and, and blacker. He's doing that thing. He's clearly like an articulate, like well-read, educated kid. He's wearing a he's wearing like a, a menudo leather jacket and like those gloves and the untied boots. He goes, "I'm a real nigga. I'm a like, shut up. Oh God, shut up. I'm a realer nigga." That's the most offensive thing is that you, there's more than one special. <laughs> I know. Oh yeah. No, exactly. Like I, he's a guy that like you know broads like I guess and people. Uh, how many specials does he have? At least two, then, right? Wow. If you went to the New York, the Comedy Cellar on a Tuesday night at one in the morning and threw a rock, you'd hit somebody funnier than Nick Cannon. <laughs> I mean, or, or honestly, really? Yeah. I mean, uh, who's less funny than Nick Cannon? You know well, what? the only the people on the, the 50th, uh, the 50 best comedians of all time. <laughs> well, what are you guys doing watching Nick Cannon special? Well, I was flipping the channel and I said I have to do it. I, I, I got to get it right off. I, it was like the 9/11 footage. Most stand up, I turn right off. Yeah. When it comes on. I can't watch it. Now, now Chad is here. Chad from St. Louis, you're a comedy fan. But you've done stand up. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And Chad is a depressed medical student. Exactly. <laughs> Were you depressed today? That's redundant, I think. Were you depressed? Right. Is that true? Are they all? <laughs> yeah, we can just put yeah. like that's so That's so sexual. <laughs> Suck that, baby. Uh, so now, were you depressed today, getting up? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you get up? What do you do? Uh, you know, I you got the Zoloft. Do you still take Zoloft? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You well, took you took Zoloft. Right? Oh, I did. I, I snorted. It makes it hard to come, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being depressed does too. Well, sure, sure. Well, that's the deal with an antidepressant. You could either be depressed and be able to fuck, or happy and you can't fuck. Dude, of all the symptoms, of all the fucking symptoms, sexual dysfunction. I know. I, I mean, know. if there was one thing that's going to stop you from taking it. Well, that's what I mean. It's like you could be happy and not fuck. Yeah. But does that? I mean, do you have do you have a girlfriend? I mean, I, not now. Not now. No. What, what, did, did it affect your relationship? The Zoloft? No, it's just uh, usually when I if I hit, hook up with a new girl though, right? And like I can get hard and it's fine. We can have sex, but sometimes it's just it's hard to like get to that. It's like you got to get over the hump. Oh, but but if you're you with can. a chick, they hate that. Yeah, they they don't want it. Like they want to know that you get you she gets you hard quick, like right? Well, they. Something? <laughs> they might be gay. Is that the no Zoloft is? I know what he's talking about. Yeah. You know what Zoloft is a cool nickname. It's not. It's a bad antidepressant. I haven't if you say you're Zoloft, you'll get laid. <laughs> Wait, I'm Zoloft. <laughs> having sex with you can't come is borderline torture. I know. Borderline. I know. Welcome to marriage. Uh, it gets old. It gets old, and then you just—it's frustrating too. And then you're just like, I just get it. It's I don't know how people. Are, I don't know how people are together for longer than a year. It's like I don't want to. Have a joke that that uh, it's like like ninety percent of the people think of somebody else when they're having sex. Oh well, yeah, marriage. absolutely. And he's like, some people set out to find their. Who's this joke? I, I don't know who oh, okay, yeah. it was, but uh, some people set out to find their real dad. I'm looking for my my. My dream mom. Right. Right. Have I haven't rephrased it. Right, right, right. I'm looking for the, the, the <laughs> woman my father was thinking about when he conceived me. <laughs> uh, I know, because by the time my father conceived me, they, might, they were together for a year. He was probably over it. Uh, now, now, so uh, are you depressed, like, on a level of not suicidal? We talked about this. I mean, you're, no, you're not. Yeah, no. yeah. Not I, never, so, I never really think about that. And I know well, that. you know, you're depressed. I mean, you know, how do you get out of that? You're alone in St. Louis. You're from Memphis. <laughs> That's right. 
That's being right. alone and being depressed in this town. Ooh, I mean, wow. I'm kind of reclusive at times. I mean, yeah. it's just, uh, well, that's good. You, just, you just get through it. I don't know. You go to class? Uh, not really. I'm doing <laughs> research now. <laughs> is that what this is? Research? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I stand myself nine times. I mean, that's a very, very severe thing, right? right? Would you like to interview me about that? No. When I tell people, thank you, when I tell people that I did that, like, in a group therapy, I, like, even, like, the kids who are, like, like, gangsters who have hung women from buildings go, damn. And I immediately become the real, the street cred guy. I become, I'm like, curious, the, I become the boss of the therapy. Now. You said that you, you haven't done therapy much. No. Why? I just get tired of it. I don't know what to say to people. We well, obviously the, need it, right? I'd say if if there were a magazine called Needs Therapy, I'd be a, I'd be on the cover as much. Right. As so like, what's you know. the? I mean, are you are you worried about what 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 makes it tiring for you? Uh, I'm not doing something I want to do. I'm very selfish. I, you know, this business when you become a successful comic early on, you know, you become a child. This business lets you. We talk about this all the time. It lets you be a child all the time. You have no boss. No one tells you what to do. And I, I get. You know what? It's terrible. I, I get in the therapy session. I don't want to be here. And I leave. You know. Be, being a child is encouraged in this business. Right. Right. Look at me. Yeah. Uh, my pants don't fit. <laughs> I look like I went to clown college. <laughs> uh, Actually, the guy, t- t- and when we were improvising, uh, that's right, uh, and uh, crashing, that guy, T.J. Miller, said to me, you look like you work for a homeless person. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Uh, but I'm worried about Chad, because you're the youngest here. Yeah. I'm, I've given up. <laughs> uh, clearly, Dan has. Uh, I don't know what Dan's, Filato's motive is. I don't know why he's here. Like, Dan says, I just like, I just, I, you know, I'm a good friend. He's such a good guy. I mean, like, when I say to Dan, why are you staying in this situation? There's got to be something better in Chicago, right? Like Northwestern has a home game. He's too good of a guy, I think. I think so, too. too good. All right, Chad, calm down. Uh, why do you stay here? Why do you stay in this situation? For it, moments like this, Artie. Is it sexual? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you're, un, you're just like a great person. You really are. As is Russ. Uh, Paul, I don't know well enough. Uh, and Dan, of course. Oh, Dan and I didn't see each other for a while. But, Chad, you're the young person. You're alone in St. Louis. Like, yeah. What are you going to do tomorrow night? Uh, work. What What do you do? It's just computer shit. I work from home a lot. What I do you mean, do? Uh, researching brain stuff, neuroscience stuff. But that, that's work? For me. How yeah. do you make money? I got it. Well, I mean, I get paid a stipend. Oh, so, really? Because I'm in graduate school. Okay. Right? So, you know, I get my stipend to do that. They give you a stipend? To work yeah, I didn't oh. have to pay for med school or anything. Wow. So, was it a scholarship? Uh, kind of. It's if you do both degrees, the MD and the PhD, right. it takes like eight years. Wow. The kind of deal oh is we'll God. pay for it and we'll pay you 30 grand a year, which isn't a lot, but here it's actually decent, Yeah, but right? good, so that, how else are you going to be a medical? To get through medical school, my ex-girlfriend, Adrian, tried, you, you're never not in a book. You have to drop out of society, so you can't work and do it. Right? Well, people have always given me a hard time about that. I don't know. When I was I'm doing not giving a, you a hard time. I think well, it's no. amazing. Well, no. I just mean uh, when I was doing open mics around here, like at the Funny Bone and stuff, right. I would have like my anatomy textbook. And you would read it on stage like Lenny Bruce? No. I would, I would read it while I was waiting. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you see, up. what a work ethic. He's, he's doing medical school while you're waiting to go up and tell jokes. <laughs> Uh, I couldn't see myself doing it. I ended that. up just being shitty at both of the things. Well, that's the thing. You have to focus. Right, right. Right, Russ? Yeah. Paul, do you have to focus? <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> you have to focus. <laughs> As I'm nodding. And he's amazing. I think Chad's amazing. He's got some resumes. And he's no joke. I just used my, uh, I just used my report card from 12th grade. <laughs> <laughs> you should throw him up for five minutes. See what happens. Do you want to go up tonight? No. I don't. <laughs> I absolutely do not. No. Come on. I, I don't You're a stern know. guy. They know you from the podcast. Why don't you go up and just last as long as you can and get off? The crowd will appreciate Russell it. Russell, go back up. <laughs> you no know, problem. Russell will be there. We'll totally bail you out. It's up to, I don't know. The MC, the MC last night pissed Russell off on stage. He yelled something, and I said, oh, this is going to be hilarious. Uh, they wanted Russ to get off, I guess. Uh, right? and he, he said, well, it was early. He said, it's your time. And uh, and the kid came over to me, and I knew Russ was going to just go longer and fuck with him. And I, thought, I said, I'm going to sit down and enjoy this. I almost got popcorn. And the kid came up to me and said, uh, did that get you angry? I'm sorry. I said, no, I didn't get angry. I got caught. Comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, uh, but Russ will be right there. Or I'll come up. You can introduce me if it goes bad. What do you have? Do you have, do you have jokes about your stipend? Yeah, I have, I have stipend jokes, right. People Depression is a great way to write jokes, though. It is. I, what about the women you clearly hate? Well, I dated an Oriental. I could do a little bit about that. Do it. Do it. Hit the slope thing? I don't know. It's just uh, I haven't done it in years now. And yeah, I don't really have anything what's, prepared. What's or, ironic about or a coincidence is t- two people to your left 
Two people to your left is a person who's had more sex with an Oriental than anyone. Oh, who's not Oriental. Is well, I'm saying, I'm talking numbers. Is that word still not racist here? In the same <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm not up to, I'm not up to Oriental yet. <laughs> I'm still on Panhead. That's sex with an Asian lady on a train. I've seen, I've seen Russ close an Asian girl on the end train. <laughs> Uh, and the entry I thought was uh, took you to Harlem, of course. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> Chad, so you you ne- will you never do stand up again? Then that's it, right? You know, I just do my podcast thing, and you have a podcast. Yeah, everyone has a podcast. I know it's true. I don't feel I don't feel special at all. <laughs> uh, I'm doing a podcast. Apparently, uh, you have enough money for a mic. <laughs> what is the podcast about? I don't know. I talk to, like, Black Packers and stuff. Oh, so you're a big Stern guy. That's the, yeah. Chad is a very big Stern fan. I'm still fan. a Stern fan. I don't like the show now as much as I used to, just like uh, everybody says. But, you know, I like to get into the stuff that they don't really touch on on the show anymore. It's but like you called him up specifically show. about me once and got... Did Multiple you get, times. Right. I mean, like, a few months ago. What do you when, say? Uh, what's his name? The guy who used to be for Writer Online, now he writes for the Daily Mail, Adam Levy. Adam Levy. Levy. Oh. Yeah, he wrote an article a month or two ago, and I always, you know, I'll call in, ask right. a normal question. Right. And be like, hey, can I ask one more thing? Right. Yeah. Adam Levy is shitting on you. Right, on uh, Stern. Yeah, and, you know, that was... He's shitting on both of us sometimes. Yeah. He likes me better, though, I think, because Howard doesn't recognize him. You know, all you got to do is acknowledge the kid and he'll like you. Yeah. But, you see, here's the thing. The rumor is Howard got him fired from Raider Online, and the kid failed upwards because now he's at the Daily Mail. Right. And that's a big deal. That gets all over the place. So anytime, <laughs> anytime I go on a Howard rant, he just prints it. <laughs> and Howard has to deal with it on some level because that's a big paper, right? Yeah, it's the most read uh, online news publication. So uh, yesterday, the other day, I got mad at something, and I said, uh, "Someone said to me, aren't you don't aren't you uh, upset that you blew it? Like you you don't have that job anymore?" And that really gets me mad. I, I go, that, "Listen, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to wake up tomorrow at four a.m. and ask Marcy Turk what I could say on the Pelican Show." <laughs> And uh, I think uh, I think that's going to be recognized. Looks like Gary having to ask her if he can host oh, the Gotham the, Comedy Show. That's the best. Thing. Right. What happened? Oh, Apparently, what? he had to ask somebody to. <laughs> <laughs> and she's Gary's boss. Well, I think he, he mentioned something on air, and I construed it that way. So he said it to, to she's Howard. She's Gary's boss. He said, "I didn't ask you, Howard, but I asked someone else." Right, and then she asked Howard. Howard. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, Gary, I hope you fucking listening. What are you doing? You have sons. Your sons have two mommies. I don't care. Whoever told Gary he could, who he could throw is the enemy. I, he would have thrown for one second. I would have said, don't do this, Gary. Don't do it. You're horrible. You throw like one of the Olsen twins. John Hines said he could throw. He's not your friend. He's not your friend. It's like the fucking... It, it, they're living under fucking uh, Sharia law over there. What's it called, Dan? Sharia law? That's it. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, uh, you're always. I think you're on my side, right? Do you, I, I think you're like uh, someone who's honest, but you uh, you're pro me with the stern thing. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll be honest with you about stuff. I don't right. always like you know kiss your ass or anything. No, you never kiss my ass. And, uh, uh, now's an example. You. Uh, I don't know. You, you've always made me laugh on the show. Really? Well, yeah. not here, apparently. Well, you know, sometimes here. I don't think you smirked. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing the dance shows. He was like this. <laughs> it looked like uh, it looked like a messing mule commercial. Oh, brother. Anyway, I'm glad to have you here. Just to make just to make Dan move the mic like that, it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Now, Paul, have you been on the road? Yeah, it was uh, it, not a tough road. Virgin Islands. Yeah, where'd you go with that? St. Thomas. And then I, I took in a day of uh, Yankee spring training, and then I'm in St. Louis. You're that big of a Yankee fan. You go to spring training. Every year. Try to wow. see a game. They look but good. How long do you sit through that? Just what? It's one game. Yeah. Just, I don't know if I can do it. Just I don't relate to the Yankees anymore. They don't speak English. They got private jets, so, you know. And the, and it's not the old days, man. It's, uh, you know. I don't know. Sometimes, like, it, I don't know. It feels like this team, too. Is There's a lot of young guys, and they seem like Yankees. You know what I mean? Like, there's certain years. You mean like white like, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Mike Francesa got into a big, big trouble once. Uh, Kevin, uh, what the fuck was the name of it? Kevin? Is it Kevin Moss? What was the name of the first baseman? Yeah, yeah, Kevin Moss. Okay, he was a white guy, kind of you know, square face, like a chisel. 
<laughs> Francesca goes, I don't know, dog. I think they're going to keep this guy. You know, he's, he's got a good good uh, right field power. They got that short porch. You know, he looks like a Yankee. He looks like a Yankee. You know, he looks like a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a Puerto Rican kid goes up and goes, yo, Mike, what did that mean? What, what do you mean looking like a Yankee? Because, you know, he just looks like a Yankee. Why? Well, you know, he's in good shape. He's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why? 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 You know, I, I, you know. I, I see what road you're going down here. I don't care if they're orange or blue. <laughs> he always says, "I don't care if they're orange or blue." There's not a racist bone in my body. And uh, clearly, you've got a white guy. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a white guy named Bird on the team, though. So for Charlie Parker, the '70s Yankees: Willie Randolph, Mickey Rivers. Yeah, but they were like, you know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they were like real black guys. Uh. Where, what time is it? It's 10 to 7. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the show's in 10 minutes? See, this is why Russ is a pro. He doesn't give a shit. Can we make Dan carry all the podcasts as we're walking over? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, listen. So, what's the lineup? Is that kid coming back? The, 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 the MC? The okay, the MC. What do you want to do here, Russ? The MC's... Uh, now, you're going to go on before Russ, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, how long did the kid do last night? He did 10 minutes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Let him do 10. You want to do 10? Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. 10, 10, 20? Whatever you want. Perfect. And, then, uh, and you want to bring me up or you want to let the guy bring me up? Whatever you want. I like it when you bring me up. Okay. All right, yeah. Uh, and Chad will do a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it for the late show, man. If you kill, it's good for your depression. Of course, if you don't, you might be leaping up. <laughs> It'll go deeper into the depression. We may continue this. I don't know. We may not. It's a very awkward ending in the beginning of this. <laughs> Take care, Bashir. Hi, this is Leah. Yeah, this is Artie Lang from the Artie Lang Uncensored Artie Quitter Thanks. Podcast. Oh, Artie, I love you so much. Thanks for calling. Oh, of course. Doug, if you want to uh, see uh, one of the best in the business, you go to uh, the Funny Bone in Westport for shows at 7.30 and 10 tonight, plus 7 and 9.30 tomorrow. Tickets only $35. You can get more information at stlouisfunnybone.com. It is our pleasure to welcome to the program, via the appliance discounter phone lines, the great Artie Lang. What's up, Artie? Hey, what's up, man? How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm trying to adjust to being a uh, a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it's working. <laughs> yeah, I should uh, I should have abs by one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> now, when's the last time you were in St. Louis? Oh God, man! Uh, I think uh, the Rams beat the Buccaneers. I uh, I had uh, I had the Rams. Uh, I won eighty grand. No, I was actually at the Rams Buccaneers uh, game. Whether you the Rams won with Warner, yeah, the NFC that Championship. Was, yeah, I was here for that. I I was on a sitcom, the Norm Show, and I was uh, I played a college. I did stand up somewhere, and uh, isn't there like a isn't, there's like a great college here, right? Like, Washington uh, University. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And we were considered. Uh, you know, dumb. Me and the, 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 yeah. the comedian that we're, I was working with, but uh, we killed. Like you know, even smart kids, they like stupid humor. <laughs> we had a deaf interpreter girl. Like you know, the, the, you have the, the, you had to have uh, a deaf interpreter girl. Uh, that's how politically correct colleges are. And I said, you know, could you ask if there's any deaf people here? And she asked, and there was no deaf people. So I said, you can leave. We don't need you. You know, we'll, we'll get you paid and everything. But because it's a distraction. And uh, she wouldn't leave. So I, I asked her what the word was uh, for vagina. Mm. And literally the word, well, but I used the other word. Can you curse you? Regular- no. Uh, regular- no. Regular- no. Regular- no. no. Okay, yeah. So, you know, the, the P word for vagina. Doug, and, that's... Uh, literally, it's, uh, she made a triangle by her crotch. <laughs> that's the deaf thing for it. So after every joke, for no reason, I just said that word. <laughs> and she said the joke and that she had to make that, that she had to do that. So it was like a half an hour of that. So she was almost crying by the end of my set. <laughs> Colin Quinn came out and he tells a joke to bombs and he walks over to her and hits her on the head and said, is this thing working? <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. That's funny. And then That's I ran out and said that word real quick. And, uh, <laughs> then they get this off stage, the sorority girl, um, who was paying us. And that uh, that was my experience at uh, Washington University. <laughs> do you do you think that uh, it, it's tougher for comedians now because we, we do live in times of political correctness? Some would say yes. run amok. Does it, it make it, it harder? Well, oh God, it's insanely hard. It, it, political correctness is the enemy of comedy. It's, it's like, you know, it's like asking... 
uh, Superman if, uh, you know, uh, Lex Luthor is allowed to have uh, the penthouse in his building. You know, <laughs> you, you, you have to get through it. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. It's it's the direct opposite of comedy. It's, it's, it's our worst enemy, and I hate it. And a lot of comics feel the same way. Even comics, who, like, you know, uh, black comics who are amazing, uh, like geniuses like Chris Rock and Chappelle. Like, I talk to them, and, you know, even though they can get away with more than white comics, they hate it, too, because they don't like anything that takes away from something funny, you know? Well, you're able to do whatever you want on your podcast, right? Well, yes and no. You know, obviously, freedom of speech, I can't get arrested for anything I say, but... Uh, but you don't you have know, sponsors, so you don't have to worry about being beholden to, like, somebody bitching to an advertiser, you know? Right, right. I don't have to worry about that, but show business is a privately run organization. They can hire or not hire who they want. If they hear something offensive on my podcast, I'm not going to get arrested. I'm going to keep doing the podcast, but they might not hire me because it was offensive, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's almost uh, bad for me to be able to say anything I want because I'll be working construction next week. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're on crashing now on HBO. The show is phenomenal. Congratulations on that thing, man. That that first episode where you're just kind of riffing there with Pete Holmes, that was oh. an incredible scene. Oh, thank you. I, well, you know, it's funny. You know, Judd Apatow, I didn't know he was a fan of mine. He had, he had both of my books and... Uh, the way I found that out was uh, he, he tweeted out a picture of Andy Dick once, and I know Andy. Uh, Andy and I used to <laughs> in the nineties in L.A. We, we had a couple of fuel nights that were kind of crazy, <laughs> and I, uh, I, I neither one of us barely remember. But uh, over Andy's shoulder, one of my Twitter followers said, "Look, Art, like he was in the Judge's library." And over Andy's shoulder in Judd's library was my book, Too Fat to Fish. He said he likes your book, and so I tweeted Judd, and he said, "Yeah, I'm a fan." So that's kind of how we first got to know each other. And then when he was shooting Amy's movie uh, in 2014, he was at the Comedy Cellar, the, the, the club we were at, right? Remember, remember we were there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we were there together, Tim, right? Yep. I, I, uh, for briefly, but I, um, we were born up in that night. But I, uh, you know, I, I saw him there every night working on his uh, stand-up because he wanted to get back into it. And I was there every night because I was working on this special, and uh, we got to know each other, and he called me to audition and when that scene was being shot, he knew all my crazy stories. So at the last second, he, you know, we're about to shoot with the lighting and everything. And he said, just forget the script. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, just look at Pete and tell him some of those stories in the book and just tell him why he might not want to be a comedian because you're kind of the, the ghost of comedy future. Look what you could look like if uh, you stay in this business. And uh, I just uh, talked for like 15 minutes till I ran out of film. <laughs> and it was it was perfect. I mean, because it truly was. It was honest. I mean, it was real. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. And, and, you know, a lot of it's dark comedy, but it is. Cra it's a crazy business, you know. Uh, but it worked out great. You know, Judd cut it together great. Uh, you know, I'm really proud of it. You know? And so you, the show Crashing, which airs on HBO Sunday nights, nine thirty Central Time, uh, got picked up this week, right, for a second season? Yeah, yeah. We got a second season, so uh, you'll be seeing more of. Uh, of me on television. <laughs> Look, I've been on, I've been on uh, network uh, shows. I've been on a late night sketch show with Man TV. I've been on a sitcom with Norm. I've had deals. And, you know, I've had my late night uh, show with Direct TV. I've done everything you can do, but this is the most uh, sort of prestigious thing. You know, this is the kind of thing where you might go to the Emmys, you know, even if it's just driving Judd there. Because <laughs> I'm friends with him. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to be even a recurring character on an HBO show. And getting picked up was amazing. Now, eight years ago, you were on HBO with a friend of our show and a friend of yours as well. He wrote the foreword to, uh, or you wrote the foreword to his book, right? Or did you write, No, Buck wrote the foreword to your yeah, book, your no, second right. book. The second book. My first book, Howard wrote the foreword to. And then the second book, uh, I was writing it with you know, the Joe Buck uh, story, as it was, was going to be in there. So Joe, the greatest guy in the world, Joe, man. People, uh, I hate when people badmouth him, even from New York, because they think he doesn't like the Yankees or something. He's a pro. He's a voice of football and baseball, especially baseball, following his old man's footsteps. And we became friends from it. But but uh, that Joe Buck Live thing, <laughs> I, I thought I was helping him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's how out of it I am. And he's been, he was on your podcast like like two months ago, and he was up in uh, New York to call a, a Giants game, if I'm not mistaken. And you guys just yeah. like BS for like 45 minutes, so much so that right. I think he forgot that he had a book signing that day. Yeah, he had a book signing, and of course, Joe, uh, 
uh, wrote a book about the uh, the harrowing uh, tales of someone with hair plug addiction. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, I said, Joe, listen, you can you can BS everybody else. I'm a heroin addict. Don't come in here and say you had a hair plug addiction. <laughs> I, I, I remember being in group therapy at Hazelton with a bunch of people going, yeah, you know, I couldn't get away from the hair plugs. Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, I wish you would have told me this when I was working with David Spade. I could have gave him a number of your counselors. <laughs> Hair plug addiction. I, I said, listen, what does that mean? Like, you have, like when you go there, you have Valium because of the pain? He goes, no, I just want it to look better. And uh, I said, well, I'll just move on from that. I can't touch that. But we won't be friends if I continue. <laughs> Being uh, well, being on the road uh, as a stand up can be uh, you know a tough thing to do. You've you know you're on a show now. You've hosted a show. You've been in a ton of movies. How do you keep uh, your enthusiasm for uh, the the stand up part of your career? Well, it used to be cocaine. <laughs> uh, that's that's right. how you keep your interest. <laughs> uh, now I think uh, the kids uh, have a new name for cocaine. They call it Adderall. And uh, the dealers are now doctors. But um, I, I, I don't know. You know what it is? It's like the love of paying my rent. Okay. I, uh, I, I look at some of the people that, um, you know, uh, lose interest in what they do for a living, and, and, and they become homeless because nowadays there's so few jobs. I mean, I think robots are going to eventually take over comedy, you know. Uh, they're already taking over comedy. Aziz Ansari, I believe, is a robot. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 look, I love doing stand-up. I love, I love getting laughs. And uh, if you don't get laughs, it's even more interesting. Uh, because as a veteran, you've seen everything. But um, to travel the country and, and to get paid to hopefully make people laugh, it's it's great. I, I can't bitch about it, you know. Artie Lang's our guest here on the Ryan Kelly Morning After. It's 590 The Fan KFNS. You can see him tonight at the Funny Bone, Westport, 730 and 10 tonight, 7 and 930 tomorrow. Tickets, 35 bucks. Get more information at stlouisfunnybone.com. So you're doing the podcast. You were doing the direct TV show. And, and, and I've thought that it's inevitable. I mean, there's been so many opportunities, I would think, for Howard Stern to have you back in, in studio and talk it over. But that, that hasn't happened. Do you think that's ever going to happen? No, no, it'll never happen. No, I, I, we hate each other's guts. I don't know how that happened, but uh, I, you know, I, he he hates me, and I don't know why. I mean, I I just wanted to ask him why he hates my guts so much, uh, to the point where he just won't even mention that I exist unless somebody brings it up. Uh, I've had people go in there who have told me that uh, you know they say don't bring up my name. <laughs> I, I I mean, I was there eight and a half years. I don't know how you you do that. Yeah, I don't know how you pretend I wasn't there. I mean, look, uh, an obvious answer would be, well, I hate you, Artie, because, uh, you know, you fell asleep on heroin on my show. Okay, there you go. But uh, that, that would be a blatant uh, way to hate me. But we talked about that already. You know, I knew he was already kind of forgiving me for that. Like, there's got to be something else I did in the blackout. Like, I don't know what I had. But maybe there isn't. I know he, he has the ability to cut people out of his life. But we were tight, man. He, we were we were great friends off off screen and, and uh, off air and great friends on air. I worked two feet from the guy for a decade, and we you know our, our girlfriends at the time. My girlfriend was really close with his girl Beth, and we had a blast. So I don't know; it's a mystery. But other people have similar stories, and I think when you're that kind of brilliant, and I do believe Howard is some kind of he's a he's a better a better thinker than most people. He's definitely on another level. I think maybe it's hard to to you know, relate to people. And life gets complicated. He, he runs a mini empire there. He's got uh, uh, children and an ex-wife, a wife, a, a new home, and this home, and that home, uh, you know, uh, people work for him. It's very, very hard. I, I must be to be him because and I'm being serious about that. So maybe it's like, you know, you don't have time to to, to ask Artie if, uh, you know, he's he's wearing clean underwear. And uh, everything's fine. So I think he just sort of cut me out. And, uh, I think at the very least we should have an honest talk about that, but he's not capable of it. I, th I was under the impression, and I think you mentioned this on your podcast already, that, that when Robin was dealing with cancer a couple of years ago, you guys all were together, just the three of you, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, well, that wasn't planned, though. You know, it's very weird. Like, after I um, after I left the show, the, the last day of work was terrible for me there. It's... Uh, 
December of 2009. I, uh, and, and after I went and I, I stabbed myself and I went to rehab, uh, he called me in rehab, and we had a nice conversation, but it wasn't wasn't detailed. Like, friends would have a conversation. It was kind of weird. And then, I, you know, it's funny. He planned on just never talking to me again. Like, I know that was his plan now, and that, that really... <laughs> Yeah, look, I'm not saying he wasn't justified, but man, that's odd. For any friend, not, not just a famous friend, for any friend uh, that you were that close to, just go, okay, I, I plan on never seeing you again and talking about you ever again. And uh, that, that's odd because the Robin thing was a complete mistake. I, I, I went unannounced to, to the hospital when Robin had her operation mm -hmm. initially, and... Um, you know, she was coming out of the operation. I heard she was taking visitors. I checked with her assistant first. I did the right thing. But no one knew exactly where I was going. So I showed up with a gift. And it's so funny. The, the, the hospital in New York, the security guard was a stern fan, I guess, and real sort of uh, New York cynically looked at me and went, he's up there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. You know, I can see Ollie Frazier fight, too. And I went up, and it was just me. And, and, I, and Howard and Robin, I walked in, and of course there's a bigger situation on the table. Robin is is fighting death, literally. I mean, she came to this operation, and I always knew she'd make it. She's the strongest, and the, the, I'm so glad she's still with us. Man. She's the best. But we, I walk in there, and, you know, Howard looks at me, and he goes, uh, the, you know, we haven't seen each other in uh, years, and he goes, uh, a couple of years at that point, he goes, uh, oh, you know, we got to make Robin laugh. This is the perfect person, are you? we got to make her laugh. Because she had just come out of operation. I gave her the gift, and me uh, and Howard sat down, and we, we made Robin laugh, and she made us laugh like we were on the radio again. It was it was almost touching. You know? I uh, we, we talked for an hour, and then Howard had to leave. And because I got there later, I was going to stay for a bit, but I said, Howard, can I talk to you outside? I said, look, I, I just, I just got to tell you I'm sorry, man. I don't know what happened here, but I, I apologize. And, and, you know, and, and he, he goes, how you doing? I go, I'm, I'm okay. He goes, uh, you doing good with money and everything? I said, yeah, you know, I'm, uh, that, that'll never be a problem. I, I saved enough cash and I'm working. And he goes, that's good. And he hugged me and he clearly wanted to get out of there. He kind of rushed it and I, I didn't want to bug him. And that was it. Yeah. Last time we spoke. And were you thinking at that time that that would be the last time you spoke when you were seeing him there no, at the hospital? No, no. He seemed friendly to wear. I said, no, he was friendly here. But, but it was a very different situation, you know, uh, and I went in, and uh, Robin and I had a very nice talk. But it's odd, like, you know, I, 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 I can sense Robin wanted, knew I wanted to ask her, what happened here? Like, we were just, like, family. <laughs> and and now I know I have a drug problem, but he's the only guy who never forgave me, <laughs> you know, in my entire life. You know, they teach you in the rehab, if you have a heroin problem, your soul goes and you lose friends and... Uh, the only friend I really lost was his. I'm not talking about a work guy, a friend. Mm -hmm. It's the worst. It really sucks. Man, that sucks. That absolutely sucks. That's such an odd thing, though. Like, it'd be one thing, like, if you did something that really pissed him off, then he couldn't forgive you, but then you see each other, and you're cool, well, yeah, and then he won't talk about you on the show, though. Right. We saw each other, though, because, you know, Howard, he's also a very appropriate person. He's like, you know, well, well our problems are nothing compared to what Robin's dealing with, and, so we, we 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 dealt with that there, and uh, it almost was a perfect place to talk about anything else. And, and I agreed with that part of it. But uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, he just planned on never seeing me again. I can't do that with people. It might be the Italian of me in Jersey. I can't. I I can't do that. I gotta. I I I, I can't. It's somebody, look. I'm in the wrong here. I, I, I was a drug addict, and uh, I did a lot of things wrong, but I felt he had forgiven me. I, I guess not. So what are you going to do? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Well, things have turned around, that's for sure, with what you got going on with HBO. Uh, and now yeah. the stand-up gigs, killing it. The season of crashing, second season picked up this week by HBO. And one of the reasons why I think the thing works so perfectly... Artie is because not only do you have brilliant people involved with Judd, but you and Pete are like the complete opposites, and so the uh, vibe is just perfect. Right? Yeah, yeah. We we look at each other like we're different zoo animals. <laughs> it's odd. He's uh, very Midwestern, very, uh, very uh, you know, uh, white bread, uh, uh, religious, very, very Christian, and um, uh, he said I like uh, Christian rock, and I said I like Chris rock. So it's kind of like we have a lot of him. <laughs> but uh, 
there was a joke that will make the final cut. Yeah. But, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> he's very pale, and I'm very like I can the, in the sun. I can get that uh, that Naples lovely down Italian uh, tan, and we look like th- literally different species, and that works absolutely. <laughs> Already Lang, our guest here on 590 The Fan, KFNS 105.7 HD2 FM and Inside STL.com, performing tonight at the Funny Bone in Westport, 7.30 and 10, and tomorrow, 7 and 9.30. Tickets, only $35. Uh, and people can uh, listen to the podcast. It's at artiequitter.com, Doug, artiequitter.com. What do you do, like four of those a week or so? Uh, we try. You know, it's simple. Uh talking into a mic, it's like a, a sort of tight, we set it up to where my buddy Danny, the producer, he came up with the idea, he goes, to hell with sitting down, just do it like you're doing stand-up. And I just stand up in my living room with the mic, and uh, he's working a board, and even if we have a guest, I walk around like I'm at the club tonight, you know, and I watch TV and just, just riff on whatever comes to my head, it's, it's a blast. Yeah, you do it from your place, right, in Jersey? Yeah, I do it. It tells you kind of person I am. Uh, I do this podcast from my kitchen. I've been late 14 times. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hit traffic. I hit traffic by the second bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> do, you have, do you have to work hard? Do you have to work hard at, at the stand up? I mean, do you think about it a lot before you go out, or does it just all flow naturally? You know, I got to tell you. I, 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 I've been BSing about this my entire career. I've been telling people I work hard because I feel that's what I have to do. But no, mm-hmm. no, it, it, honestly, maybe I'd be a better comic if I if I worked hard. I'm not saying I'm some great comedian, but to 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 to, to just be a working comic like you see, it takes absolutely no work on my part at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, get, I, I get up and I'm able to just I see something funny and it goes in my head and I sort of try to write it in my head and I go in age and I say it and it works out to where I get enough laughs to where I can make people forget they're overpaying for a beer you know uh, and uh, that's led to other stuff so uh, maybe if I worked at it I'd be like you know uh, good but maybe this is as good as I get I'm not a preparer I hate preparing for stuff and and that was Howard's genius in sort of judging what I could do on the radio. He knew I wasn't going to be the guy who, you know, sat there writing till midnight. He knew I was kind of a, the guy who, like, he started talking and I started riffing with him. And and it would be better spontaneous-wise. And the, uh, he had just started a different lifestyle. He was in New York with a, uh, a big apartment and a, a new girl. He was going out and I didn't want to be at the office that much, so I fit in. and would stand up... Uh, you know, it's the same thing. I just kind of riff. It's no, it's uh, it's no work at all. God bless America. You gambling at all anymore? Is the NCAA tournament like tempting for you? Uh, well, gambling. Yeah, I don't know if you call uh, having fifty grand on the game uh, the other day. Make no, uh, <laughs> no, not not in these circles. Gambling. No, <laughs> that's no, play money. That, uh, I can't get rid of. I, oh, so you still are? Yeah, I gamble. Yeah, with a bookie too. You know. I like doing it with somebody dangerous because uh, it limits me. Um, uh, so this guy's a bit of a, you know, he can be sarcastic and hurtful on the phone. Uh, <laughs> did, so did you have action I, yesterday? I, I said, no, you know what? I go through spurts. I didn't have anything at all. I like Northwestern, though. I knew they were going to win at least one round. It was your guy Danny Filato's team. We were watching the game together yesterday. He was all over Northwestern. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Dan is such a pain in the ass. <laughs> Dan is a Chicago Cub fan, through and through, right? And he wins. And I felt so happy for him. Like, I was so happy. Uh, you know, these Cub fans don't have to bitch anymore about Bartman and this and that and Harry Carey. And, and finally, 108 years, they win. And then two seconds later, he doesn't savor that at all. He's like, I know the Bears are losing. <laughs> savor the Cubs. Who cares? Who cares if another Chicago team wins ever? And now he's on the Northwestern thing. I thought Northwestern were only theater people. What is David Schwimmer, the point guard? <laughs> <laughs> Artie Lag tonight at the Westport Funny Bone, St. Louis Funny And then uh, also tomorrow, 7 and 9 30. Tickets, $35. Get more information, St. Louis Funny Artie, congratulations on crashing. Congratulations on the success of the podcast and uh, the stand up gig, man. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you this evening. Once again, 7 30 and 10 o'clock tonight, 7 and 9 30 tomorrow. Thanks for jumping on the show, man. We appreciate it. Well, and, uh, you guys are doing me a favor. Thank you for plugging it. I, I really appreciate it, too. And, I, and uh, thanks for the time. And if any of you guys work there at all, come by the, the show tonight. Please let me know. We'll uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless America, man. Thanks, Artie. Thanks, Artie. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you again. Bye bye. There he All is, right. Artie Lang, with us here on the program, kind of getting deep on the Howard Stern thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can, How about you that? can feel his pain. Right? I mean, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't aware of some of that stuff. Man, I wasn't man. aware of a lot of that stuff. I tell you, the one thing about Artie is just having followed him a little bit, not to the extent uh, where you guys hang out together, uh, but I could see how people forgive him because he is a lovable guy who has uh, admittedly made mistake after mistake after mistake, but you can't help but like him. Yes. When I did the show with him, um, yeah, I mean, it was, for me, just as intimidating as it can possibly be because, I mean, that, that show, the Howard Stern show, is what I grew up on. It's without question. You know, we, I obviously... Joke steal. about that we or I steal, uh, but I mean it's an influence. It's a huge influence, um, and I just have the greatest amount of ad from admiration for it. And the thing that I would love on that show that I thought was the best, and it's not the the way I feel now. Back when I was growing up, was when they would just do random hour plus long segments. I would love that. So now you can kind of see where it comes from. Um, and when Artie was the three, Howard being the one, Robin the two, and Artie the three. Artie was so quick. I mean, so quick. He was just the ultimate sniper. And um, and now I really enjoy the Stern Show for the interviews, but I don't really enjoy the riffing anymore. And I think that's because the void left by Artie has never been replaced, but it's not something that you can replace because the guy's so sick, talented, and cutting and quick. But when I do that show with him uh, a few years ago on, on, on DirecTV... You know, I was like, oh, my God, I'm meeting Artie Lang. Not only am I meeting Artie Lang, but I'm doing a show with him a couple nights in a row. The, the first night we did the show, it was me, Artie, and then Jim Norton um, was our guest. And uh, we get done, and Artie goes, hey, I'm doing a set tomorrow at uh, Gotham. Uh, before the show, if you and uh, Anna Marie want to come up, uh, I'll be with Adrian. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a bite to eat, and then we'll come over and do our show. Because our show didn't start till 11 Eastern. And uh, so he was doing this comedy set. And he gives me his number. I text him, and he comes out. There's a huge line because David Tell was performing, Gilbert Gottfried, Susie Essman, who most people probably don't know by name, but she plays Jeff's wife in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Jeff, you fat F. Hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. Hilarious. So the next thing I know, already, you know, it's New York City, and he gets us in through this whole line. These people are looking at us like, who are you guys? And we go downstairs into the green room, and it's just me, Artie, uh, his fiance, or I don't know if his fiance or girlfriend, Adrian, and uh, Adrian Barbeau. It wasn't Adrian Barbeau. Was she in Swamp Thing? Yeah, she I in believe she it? was. And he should have been married to her. He wouldn't have had all these problems. You think yeah. Adrian Barbeau would have saved his soul? Uh, and Anna Marie, and then Anna Marie and Adrian uh, kind of hit it off and, and became friends, and then they wound up hanging out later that night while Artie and I were doing our show, but we're sitting there, and then Gilbert Gottfried walks into the green room. So now it's the five of us, Gilbert Gottfried. And who, he said to you, eh, who are you? <laughs> so Artie introduces uh, Gilbert to his, to Adrian, who's beautiful, and uh, and if I'm not mistaken, and I realize this wouldn't necessarily be deemed politically correct, but it is Gilbert Gottfried and Artie Lang. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and, he's, and he's clearly confused as to what Adrian is doing with Artie, and, and he says... What do you have AIDS or something? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm bearing witness to this. Susie Essman rolls in, and uh, I mean there's BSing, and then Artie goes up there and was I don't know, Doug was it you that asked about how difficult it is for him to do stand up? Yeah. I mean it's just it couldn't be any any there couldn't be any less effort that goes into it, and that's not a shot. He's just sick talented, and he goes up and just kills his set. We're getting ready to go. The four of us to go to dinner and then go back. Um, the studios were in Soho. We were in Midtown. And uh, and he and as we're leaving, they say, "Ladies and gentlemen, tonight uh, for this charity event, uh, as a surprise, Jerry Seinfeld." And it stops Artie in his tracks. And then we go back in, and it's only a room that holds I don't know two hundred, three hundred people. And uh, and there's Jerry Seinfeld up there just trying out material for this charity thing. And it was so funny to watch, funny or cool, whatever it would be. Artie, Dave Attell. Gilbert Gottfried, Susie Essman, and they just stopped what they were doing to watch Seinfeld. You know, it was kind of like watching great ball players of today, you know, and there's, you know, Willie Mays, and you just stop and pay homage because, you know, mm -hmm. there's one of the absolute greats. And as we left and we're heading back down to the studio to do our show, uh, 
party goes, yeah, you know, that happens quite a bit in New York. You know, Jerry will stop by or Brock will stop by and they just try out material before they do a special or they go on the road. And, uh, you know, that just that just kind of happens. So they all hang out together. Uh, and there's like this famous table. Um, and I guess it's the comedy cellar. And uh, and only comedians are allowed to sit there and they, they just sit there and they just BS. That's what they do. And um, he's just, you know, he's a brilliant brilliant mind but he's so honest uh that i think people are so endeared by him or endeared to him because they can tell like you just said the caddies he's just a really good guy and for him to take me and my wife uh and make sure that we get in to see his set and take us out to dinner when you know i was only scheduled to be there for a couple of nights uh that just shows the kind of guy he is you know he's just a really good guy so for as many slip-ups as he's had uh that's why I think he keeps getting multiple chances. But I think with the crashing thing on HBO, which is blown up, I mean, it's only four episodes, you know, that have been on HBO so far. But like I said, it just got picked up for a second season. It's made people aware that, oh, yeah, he's still in the game. And then that scene that he was citing where he's kind of going back and forth and Judd Apatow told him to just kind of tell Pete Holmes the trappings of becoming a comedian, which wound up being honest. It wasn't scripted. It was total improv. And then people could see that he could act. And now he's getting all kinds of opportunities again. Uh, so I'm super happy for him because he's absurdly talented. And as a fan of the Howard Stern show, A, it kills me to hear how heartbroken he is by the situation. Uh, but B, because of how great he was on that show, I'm glad he's getting opportunities to do his thing again. And the stuff with Howard Stern, there was such a mystique about him, and people wonder how can he be this really good guy and be this guy on the air. It just adds to the mystique. You know, they were family, he said. They were family on and off the show, and then cuts him off, and he said he knew that Howard was like, this is the last time we're... I mean, it's intriguing. Yeah, and the picture... Um you know, Dan, when, like I said, uh, we were up at Kirkwood Brewhouse yesterday, and Dan's a Chicago guy, um, and so he wanted to watch the Northwestern game, so we just hung out there and BSed for a couple hours while that Northwestern game was on, and we were talking about a bunch of stuff, and he said, yeah, I already told this story on the podcast about how when Robin, Robin Quivers uh, was dealing with cancer, that it just so happened, Artie went to go visit her in the hospital, and he goes in, and Howard's sitting there with her. And so it's the first time they'd seen each other in years. I mean, can you imagine that scene? The three of them uh, just hanging out, and they hadn't talked in a while. But since then, you know, Artie wrote in his book, and I don't know if it was cover or if it was sincere. You know, it's kind of an awkward spot because people go, how come you haven't been back on the show? And he goes, I think Howard's doing that because he knows it would be too painful for me to go back in there. But I don't know if that's really the case anymore, you know, and uh, because now Artie's been critical of, of Howard's show and Howard refuses to even like, like Artie said, to acknowledge he exists. And Artie's getting more and more popular here with crashing. And now he's all over the place doing stand up in St. Louis this weekend, but he's traveling all over the country. It seems like a few weekends a month, but there's this awkward thing. There's this monster elephant in the room that he hasn't been on that show in seven years. He was a huge part of it, but Jackie would come back on there, even though they parted ways. And Artie, for my money anyway, was better than Jackie. And, uh, you know, it clearly just kills Artie. That was deep. I wasn't expecting to go that deep. And they don't.